Take your Bibles tonight, please, and turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. We'll start a new book study tonight, first of the year, book of Philippians, chapter number 1. Can John read? Can you hear me okay? You hearing all right tonight, Jerry? Swells? All right. Sound? Okay, good. I, when I go home after Sunday services, I'll eat and try to lay down for a few minutes if I can. And I start, turn my TV timer on to go off in a certain few minutes, and uh, I just like doing that. See if I can guess. See if I can beat it to sleep. I guess. But while I was doing that this evening, all of a sudden a commercial came on. It was a commercial for the halftime of the Super Bowl. Man alive! They were lights going off, people jumping all over the stage. Boy, they were having a time. And I said to myself, we cannot compete against that. We can't. But we can offer you something better than that. Because you see, all that happiness will be over in a matter of a few minutes. But what we have is something far better. It's called joy. This book of Philippians is a book of joy. I read this article. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 in just a moment. I read this article. Listen, if you would, please. It's, I cannot quote all of it. It take, it'll take me two or three minutes. We live in a generally sad world, a fallen world, well acquainted with despair, depression, disappointments, dissatisfaction, a longing for a lasting happiness that often never comes to pass. Moments of pleasure and satisfaction are scattered through the general pain and sorrow of life. Many people have little hope that their situation in life will ever change much, if any, for well, the better. Hopelessness often tends to increase as we get older. Long years of often uh, long sorrows, unfulfillment, loss of loved ones and friends, and often physical limitations and pain causes us sorrow. Such decreasing times of happiness tend to produce morbid sadness and lessen satisfactions with your life. Most people define happiness as an attitude of satisfaction or delight based on positive circumstances largely beyond their control. Happiness, therefore, cannot be planned or programmed, much less guaranteed. Is the experience only if and when circumstances are favorable. It is therefore exclusive, elusive and uncertain happiness is. See, and you know this already before I tell you, there's a great difference in happiness and joy. A lot of the world and people are looking for happiness and happiness which eludes them. Happiness is something that only happens with happenings, right? And you've heard this old saying so many times, it's almost ridiculous to say it again. And when your happens do not happen to happen, though you want them to happen, you're not happy. But what about joy? What about joy? Spiritual joy, on the other hand, is an attitude not dependent upon chance or circumstances, but in reality upon your relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, every young person in this room tonight, every middle-aged person, Every senior person, including this pastor, needs to learn there can be real joy no matter the circumstances of life. There can be. And it's something that it's just not happen chance. There's something available to us from God. The word joy appears some 96 times in the New Testament. Paul is going to mention them several times, 13 times, this epistle. Paul is going to talk about joy in Philippians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's look, if you would, at verses 1 and 2 tonight for a few minutes. And this will be the first two verses we'll look at tonight. Then we're going to baptize tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. Paul and Timotheus. I have no idea why they just don't say Timothy. Have you ever wondered about that? Just be honest with you. Have you? Have you ever wondered about that? It's Timotheus. Timotheus is a plural word for Timothy. And I've read everywhere I can read about why in the world. They don't know. They say, he's used Timotheus. Paul and Timotheus. 
the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, make me a blessing tonight. Speak to my heart, speak through me, then speak to me tonight. I didn't come to preach to these people. I came to help myself as well. And I pray the Spirit of God would do so in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I have all kinds of verses again tonight, so if you'll allow me, they should be on the screen for you. If not, listen to them. Let me tell you something about joy that's real. First of all, joy is a gift from God. Would you say that with me? Joy is a gift from God. Psalm 4, 7, and 8. That way has put gladness in my heart more than the times that the corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makes me dwell in safety. Psalm, 100, Psalm 16, 11. Thou will show me the path of life. Help me now. In, the, in thy presence is what? Fullness of joy. So joy is a gift of God. Second thing is joy is granted to those who believe the gospel. Luke 2, 10, 11. You've heard this verse all Christmas season. And the angels unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of what? Great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy might be full. In other words, let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus wants you to live a happy life? Yeah, John 10, 10. I've come that you might have life. You might have life how? More abundantly. Does he want you to go around looking like you've got Lindberger cheese under your nose all the time? Or like your mother-in-law came to live with you? No, not at all. He wants you to be a person that has joy in your heart. Or like you failed the test. Or like this happened or that happened in your life, uh, sadness. He wants you to be a person of joy. Also, joy is a product of the Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says in Romans uh, 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Listen to this verse of Scripture, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, I'm just going to say two of them, is love and joy. So the fruit of the Spirit is that. Then joy comes from obeying God's word. I read this verse this morning, Jeremiah 15, 11. Thy words were found, I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Here's what tells something I know by experience, that sin keeps you from being joyful. Not doing what God wants you to do keeps you from being joy. If you've ever had this experience, you're not going to tell you this. Have you ever had God speak to your heart about doing something for somebody or doing something you should do, you didn't do it? And the joy departed from you. Then you obeyed God, and you maybe had to do something else, but you obeyed God, and God gave you the joy that you were looking for in obeying Him. Then joy often comes to us in, in deepening trials. When we have trials, that, that our joy begins to be uh, more, more, uh, more seen. For instance, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 6.10, Paul said, As sorrowful, you're always rejoicing. Uh, James 1.12, My brethren, count all joy when you fall into divers temptation. And then 1 Peter tells us, he said, he talks about inheritance undefiled that fades not away, and that we are kept by the powers of God through faith, we, wherein we greatly rejoice, 1 Peter 1.6, though now for a season, if need be, uh, though in heaven is through manifold temptation. So, joy. Then one more thing, joy also is complete when we set our affections and hope upon him, uh, rejoicing in hope. Uh, Proverbs, Romans 12, 12. Whom having not seen you love, 1 Peter 1, 8. Re, but rejoicing, 1 Peter 4, 13, as much as you partake of Christ's suffering. So joy is all those things. Now, when Paul writes this letter to these believers at Philippi, he's writing to them, he's expressing to them, a wonderful thing that he's, he doesn't not give them any, any correctional. He doesn't, he doesn't give them a doctoral, anything that the doctrine needs to be corrected. Nothing needs to be corrected in the church. There were two women that were fighting in chapter four. When we get there, we'll see those two women and the, and the discussions they were having and the, and the disagreements they were having. We'll look at that. But he doesn't even correct it. He's writing to this church because he knows this church. And this is one of the greatest churches in Paul's ministry because they become so effective in his life 
They were communicating to him from the very first of the day they started preaching. They were the source of the greatest joy he had in his life. That he writes to them. He's concerned about them. He's concerned that they have sadness and not joy. And he wants to instruct them. I want you to be joyful, Christian. I want you to be joyful in every area of your life. I want you to be blessed of the Lord. I want you to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Philippians chapter 4. I have prescribed Philippians chapter 4. We're not there. We'll be there later on sometime this year. To more people than any verse of scripture in the Bible. When people come to me and they say, I'm sorry and I can't do this. and I, I'm having this trouble. I prescribe to them to read Philippians 4 verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. Can I tell you that this is a great book on joy. Now what makes it in these first two verses. Let me give you five things that causes joy in these first two little verses here. The first thing that brings joy is believe it or not is Paul's signature. Tell me the first word in, in Philippians 1. What's the first word? Paul. Now it's customary in biblical times in writings that instead of them waiting to the end of the letter to put who wrote the letter, they put their name at the first to say this is who this letter is from. How many have ever got a letter and the first thing you did is you didn't look at the first of it, you looked at the end of it? You ever done that? Because why do you do that? You want to say who, who is it from? Who's writing to me? How many of you have ever got a letter that's caused you to, to made you happy? Ever get a note that makes you happy? Well, I did. We've got some wonderful notes this Christmas season about praying for my sister and different words of encouragement. They're so gracious and so kind. And thank you very much. But you see those. And, and let me tell you something. Uh, giving notes to people and writing notes to them, I think is very important. I think it's a great ministry. I think it really encourages people in, in their life, in their walk. So you ought to do that. If you can't do other things, you ought to do that. You can, you can send a note. You can buy some note cards. You can send a note. It's important. And they do that. <laughs> did you ever get a letter from somebody and didn't know who it was from even after you read it and they signed it? I've done that before. I, I've, I've got a lady that writes me from West Virginia. And I don't know if it's because of my memory failing, because my wife's getting older. Or what? That I've got two or three letters here re recently, and I, don't, and I do not know the lady. Now, I've not, I'm, I've not written her back because I don't know her. I'm afraid I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. But I just, I just don't know who, who she is. And sometimes those letters. But what, what, is it, what is it now that caused such joy to this church? Now here's what you've got to remember. What, this, what the church would do when someone wrote them a letter, such as Paul, they would take this letter that Paul opened. They would be in church. Now picture me in church now. And they're going to read this entire letter one night to the church family because Paul sent it. The first thing I want to tell, tell you, I can think of three people in that church that night at Philippi that was happy, that was joyful. I can see when they start reading this letter, I see a woman sitting on my right hand side. And excuse me now, I don't mean to get off here on a little chasing a rabbit or something, but perhaps uh, she's kneeling over and she's praying before the church service. And I thought of Martha Hill. I just, I just thought of her. She's sit, quietly sitting over there. She's in church and she's waiting for church to start. And all of a sudden, the speaker gets up and he says, Paul. And I see that woman raise up her head from prayer. And she looks up. She says, Paul. And her mind flashes back. And you want to read about it. You can read it in Acts chapter 16. When Paul first comes to Philippi, he goes down next to a river. And they're having a prayer meeting. Here's some ladies in a prayer meeting down by the river. And all of a sudden, three men show up at a, at a ladies' prayer group. And Paul asked permission to speak to them. And he speaks to them. And a woman made of Lydia got opened her heart that day. And she got saved. And after she got saved, she opened up her house and let Paul come in and, and stay with them for a while. And when they said, Paul, I can see her face go. <laughs> There's somebody else in that church service I, not, not, I got happy. Perhaps before they'd be sitting in here, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. But they were someone who sin had enslaved their lives. They was a, it was a young lady there that, that night that she had been used by her taskmasters to make money. She had been a fortune teller. She had been one bewitched with sin. And all of a sudden, Paul shows up and the demon runs out of her. And she gets saved by the grace of God. And man, she's delivered and she frees. And when she hears the name of Paul, I bless you go, wow, yeah. I remember that day. I remember that time when Paul spoke. The Spirit of God spoke to my heart and I got saved. And then there's somebody else there. 
I see a man sitting in that church service that night. I see him with his wife and children. They're sitting there. And when he said, Paul, he relives in his mind that night when he first saw Paul. Paul and Silas had been brought to his jail where he was the jailer. You remember the story? They had been beaten, put in stocks and bonnet. At midnight, they started praising God. And, and praising God and the doors were open and everybody fled and, the, and that man knew that his life was gone he was going to take his own life and follow his own sword because if they escaped his life was not any good to anything and even himself but Paul shouted out do thyself no harm and that night at midnight that man got saved and he wanted to tell his wife about it and he took two prisoners home with him at midnight can you imagine getting your wife up at midnight and said honey I got two prisoners here and we want to give them something to eat it's midnight how many of you ladies would rejoice with that? Could I get an amen? What about an old me? And boy, they went to their house. Then now she gets saved and the kids get saved. And they said, well, we are to get baptized. And somewhere between midnight and morning, they all got baptized. Now I want to tell you a question. Would that guy be happy to hear about Paul's name? Would they be? So they're happy because of the signature of Paul, his name. Let me give you another source of joy in these two verses. He says, there were servants of the Lord. Paul and Timotheus, the servants. See verse 1? Say it with me. Paul and Timotheus, the servants. Say the what? The servants. Timothy also, his name would bring back memories. Listen to me a second, if you would please. This half Jew, half Gentile, whole Christian was devoted to Christ. He suffered the same things Paul suffered. He's just not as recognizable in what he's saying, what he's doing. When the Philippians uh, knew of him, they, they loved him as well. And he's here. He's true. Uh, he's true. He's, he stayed through all the squabbles and all the fight. And young Timothy stayed true. And they're called the servants of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a word. I'm going to give you a word. Gonna, uh, the word is doulos. Would you just say the word doulos? Say doulos. What's the word? It means that when he uses the word servant, he's using the word he's a, these, that Paul and Silas are bond slaves. They're bond slaves. What they were saying, and listen to this wonderful truth. Would you please listen to this wonderful truth just for a second? I'm, I'm going to go speedily through this. It says this. A bond slave meant that he was not his own property. He was property of the Lord that was lent to those believers at, at Philippi. And when they heard, heard the word servants... They said, these men have not come to us to be masters over us. They've come to us to serve us. I want to tell you something. One of the greatest joy that a man could ever have is to be a servant of Jesus Christ and a servant to the people of God. I'm serious. It's the greatest joy in life. And what I am tonight, I'm God's property I'm loaned to you as a servant. And what you are, you're loaned to me. We're just kind of loaned to each other for a while. And the word servant, I think, caused them to smile. Then there's a third word I want you to use. Verse 1. Look at verse 1 with me. When I stop reading, you tell me the next word. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints. He calls them saints. You know, our idea, our, our idea of sainthood in the, particularly the Catholic Church is this, is that when you do enough good deeds or a few miracles, you can be made a saint. It's about doing. <laughs> Praise God. Excuse me. First of all, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm a biblicist and a Baptist too, by the way. But I'm glad I believe the Bible that we're not made saints because of what we do. We're made saints because of what he did. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> This ought to tickle your fancy. And if we did what was scripture tonight, we'd come up and say, Hello, Saint H.B., how are you? Saint Bobby, Saint, Saint Stephen, Saint Gail, Saint Jessica. Saint, just call each other. We're Saint, Saint Daryl. Does that sound funny? Saint Daryl. We're Saint. Saint David, Saint Ronnie. We're Saints. We're Saints in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are. Can I get an amen to that? We've been bought at Calvary, placed in the body of Jesus Christ. Positionally tonight, we're as good as we're already in heaven. We're saints. I think that would cause them to rejoice. What about you? Third thing, 
He talks with me, please, if you would look at the last part of the verse. Saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the, tell me the last three words, bishops and deacons. He's, he's thanking God for these who were shepherds of these people. This is the only place in the Bible, listen close, listen, only place in the Bible where these two terms appear, appear at the same time, bishops and, shep, and uh, excuse me, and deacons. Uh, the word bishop is not a word that we normally use in our Baptist churches. Though the word's nothing wrong with the word, it means an overseer. And so he, these people that Paul had left in charge here were overseers. They're people that are overseeing the work there. Now we're told in Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. So these are bishops. Now, I want to say this to you. I want to clarify something just for a second, as a matter of maybe being a little technical. There's no such thing in the Bible as bishops over many churches. That's foreign to the Word of God. That's why we do not belong to an organization. We're an independent Baptist church. We're, we operate under our own auspices. That's what we are. We're not, under, we're not under some bishop somewhere that tells us, you've got to teach this, you've got to say this. We believe this Bible is our sole authority for practice. Amen? That's why we do that. We pay our own missionaries and don't send it through some group of people that take more out than they send to missionaries to start with. We're independent Baptists. That's what we are. We're that. So he's thankful for the bishops, those who oversee the church, and the deacons, and the deacons. And so the bishops and deacons were sources of joy in a church. Can I tell you, those who serve the church are to be joyful, are to be, cause us joy because they're willing to serve. Can I tell you, one of the greatest things you can ever have is a set of deacons that are serving God and happily serving the Lord. Amen? Can I get an amen to that? Can I, can I tell you what? Let me tell you something. In 45 years of trying to pastor, I've never seen a church have a problem when the deacons got along. So is it important that they get along? Is it important that they love God and serve God? Now, we're going to have an election here in a few Sundays about deacons. We've got some good men that are running. I can serve with any of those men, have in the past, some of them. And I'm just telling you, but it's so important that the church have good leadership where they are and, and serving God and serving God. And, and the word deacon also is the word doulos, which means one who serves and one who serves. Uh, God's not looking for some chiefs. He's looking for some Indians. People that's willing to serve. Amen? That's what God's looking for. Here's the next thing. I want you to notice the supply that they enjoy. Look with me again at verse number two. Tell me in verse number two. I'm going to read it with me. You read it with me. Verse two, the first uh, one, two, three, six words. Read it with me. Come on. Verse two. Grace be unto you and what? Peace. You know, grace is the unmerited favor of God. Aren't you glad for a grace of God that's greater than all of our past? Give me, give me an amen. Aren't you glad for the grace of God that's great enough for us in the, in the present and sufficient for us in the future? Can I get an amen to that? And let me tell you something. Oh, what people would give just to have peace. I know people tonight that would give anything in the world if they could have peace. I know people, honestly, I know, I know so, me, and, me and Brother Ben was visiting a man, a man yesterday in the hospital. And he told us he'd been saved, but he said, I'm not, I'm not doing what God wants me to do. We talked to him for several minutes. Trying, and you could look up on his face. He had no peace, did he, Ben? No peace whatsoever. You could tell he was troubled about it. He, he knew he needed to get right with God. But he had no peace. He would not be stirred to get right with God. But he had no peace. See, peace is a commodity which you can put no price on. I don't have peace in anything else. Just the pure peace of God. It brings joy to their hearts. And the source of all that peace and joy, would you look with me please? Again, at verse number two, when I stop reading, I want you to tell me the next few words. Grace be unto you and peace from and from the source of all of our peace is God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's where it all comes from. It comes from Him. The good news is that's where it comes from. You know, let me just say something interesting about this that I've never seen before in all the years I've been studying. Look with me again at verse number 2. I'm going to stop reading. You give me the word. Grace be unto you and peace from our Father. One thing foreign to all the religions of the days of Christ's time, and even many of our, our time, is, is the relationship with Father. Most of the gods that were worshipped there were not referred to as Father. Some had the, what they call Mother God that they worship, but Father. And have a Father that's so intimate, so close, is something of a preciousness to have such a dad 
of loving and care, considering this one who being God our Father. And uh, he says, God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a couple, just a couple more thoughts, and then we'll give an invitation. I've never heard a Buddhist, I've, I've met only a few Buddhists in my life, I've never heard a Buddhist say that he's in Buddha. Have you? I've never heard, any, heard anyone, uh, when I preach in India, to those people there in, 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 uh, in India, the Hindus, I never, they never talk about being in, in, their, in their relationship with their, their God, that they were there. I've never heard the Muslims talk about being in Mohammed. When we speak, we speak that we are in Christ. Is that not right? 17 times alone in Ephesians chapter 1, we're in Christ. We're in Christ. We're in Christ. Because all the source of our joy and all the source of our everlasting joy is simply found in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, that's why we are to seek to please Him. You know that? I, I, I thank God for my Pisgah Baptist Church, but you're not my source of joy. You can't be. You can't be. What, what if the day comes we're no longer here or exist? You can't be. My source of joy must be him who never changes and always remains the same. Come on. His name is Jesus, who he is. Now, a few questions. Invitation, baptism. When people mention your name, now, I don't have everybody, that, I, not everybody likes me. Not everybody likes Pastor Walls. I've got some people that don't like me. I do. And I know that. Now, my attitude toward that is that's their problem, not mine. I mean, because I love them and I never, don't try anything bad, bad against them. That's their problem. And I'm, I'm not, I don't have anything ill will against anyone in my life at this very moment. <laughs> I remember one day I was standing in line at uh, Captain D's. And uh, people often come up to me, oftentimes, almost every time I'm out, they'll say, Pastor, I watch you on television. I was standing and a man behind me said, I watch you on television. And I said, thank you. He said, I don't like it. And I said, you ought to come and hear me in person. I'm worse. <laughs> and he started laughing. We'd sat down and ate together. <laughs> I think life's wonderful, amen? Thank God for the challenges. And when people think of your name, are they happy about it? I know everyone's going to be, but I'm saying that generally when they think of your name, they said, I'm glad to hear that. I like that name. Let me ask you a question. When folks think of you, do they think of you as demanding or as a servant? Someone willing to work, someone willing to get in and get your hands dirty, someone to jump in and say, whatever wants done, we'll do it. When people think of you, or when you think of yourself in Christ, do you think of yourself as being a saint, which you are? None of us are good. None of us are, are good to the sense that uh, we have any goodness in ourselves. But in the position in Christ, do you realize tonight that you are a saint? Here's a hard question for the pastor to ask. Are you thankful for the Lord, ones who the Lord has put over you? Are you thankful? Can you give thanks to God for them? I don't know why this comes up, but I've kind of noticed in my preaching that every time around January or February, I come up with the same thought. I don't know why it is. I really don't know why it is. And I was thinking of it today is, I wonder what person in your life tonight would be encouraged if sometime tonight, it's going to be early when you get home, you'd either give them a call or first thing in the morning, write them a note. And just say, I want you to know I was thinking about you and praying for you. What a joy might cause someone's heart and life. May we find joy as we study these books, and may the joy of God be real in our hearts and our lives. Father, thank you. We love you. Now, if I gave an invitation tonight of who would like to have more joy, everybody ought to come. Probably everybody wouldn't come, but everybody ought to come. But if I could give an invitation somewhat like this tonight. If you know Jesus Christ and you're glad you're saved, would you say amen? amen? Amen. If you are facing a situation where you're just having a hard time in your life, or somebody or some event in your life, you're having a hard time of finding the joy God wants you to have in your life, I wonder, would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart? And would you come and ask Him? Say, God, I need to find some joy in this. 
And God, would you let me see the goodness of the Lord in this and, what, and what I, how I'm supposed to react to this in the right way. Would you come and ask God about that? Some of you young people here, you, maybe you're seeking happiness in the wrong place. You'd say, God, I want you to be my source of joy. I want you to be my source of joy. Some adult here that say, God, I just, I just need to have the joy of thy salvation restored to my heart and life again. I want to start fresh with you this new year. Get a fresh start with you. If you need to come for that, you need to come trust Christ to save you. If you need to come and you're going to get baptized tonight. You go ahead and come on if you're going to do that tonight.